That was very sweet, Henry. <laughs> you know, Henry's the only student I've ever had that can turn a science essay into a piece of art, complete with literary allusions and plot twists, all while making the relative scientific points. Thanks again. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the Board of Trustees, the faculty and staff, the administration, and all of you for supporting this school and this wonderful group of young women and men that we're here to honor today. I was a little surprised that you asked me to speak to you one more time. You see, they've already spent, as Henry said, hours of time listening to me lecture in class, on their retreat, in chapel, and for some on the soccer field, and yes, this year at their home via YouTube. I'm convinced that's why they picked me. They figured I'd just make the video and then they could all get to the party sooner. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. I feel a strong bond with many members of this class. It's a bond formed from a shared experience of mutual challenge. I did my best to push them out of their comfort zone every day, and they definitely challenged me. I don't mean to say they were disrespectful or difficult to work with, quite the opposite. They were a joy to work with. Instead, they challenged me every day to be a better teacher. Ralph Waldo Emerson said the difference between genius and talent is genius says things which he has heard but once. I just said that wrong. <laughs> and I've heard this a bunch of times. Talent says things which he has heard but once. Genius says things he has never heard. Knowing genius is definitely not likely now. I looked for a source of inspiration, the one place I thought I could get close to talent, Facebook. <laughs> I made a post soliciting the, base, the best advice anyone had ever received upon graduating high school, and I asked if anyone had any advice to help make a memorable and inspirational speech. What I got back were some fairly predictable responses about how to live your life and how to approach the future, and some good suggestions for my speech, most of which I will probably not heed. A former colleague of mine from Atlanta suggested that you'd all most appreciate that I begin my address with, let me be brief. <laughs> you know me better than that. <laughs> Oddly enough, I'm not here today to celebrate your graduating. You should graduate. Three million other kids around the country are. And you've been afforded just about every advantage imaginable in a school environment that's afforded you every step of the way. So just graduating, that's not impressive. It's what you do from here that counts. And I challenge you to do something and to be someone truly remarkable. For most of you, well, I guess all of you, college is the next step. But I challenge you to ask why. Is it to get a degree so you can get a job, so you can earn a decent living? I would argue, or some would argue, that you don't need college for that. You could question whether many of the classes you take in college will prepare you any better than what you could learn on the job. Some of you could perform the jobs you're going to have with the education you've already received. But today's world demands at least a college degree just to get hired for most of the jobs you'll want. So you'll go. But I challenge you to think about how you'll spend your time and energy while there. Peter Thiel, the co-founder of PayPal and an early investor in Facebook, was on 60 Minutes just last week where he suggested the benefits of college did not justify the expense or the debt incurred. He goes as far as, far as paying select students $100,000 to not go to college. Now, I think there are some serious holes in Mr. Thiel's argument, but he makes some good points about the rising cost of an education. I want you to go to college, but I want you to get your money's worth. I greatly benefited from my time at the best university in this country. <laughs> that said, I'm sure, certain I could have gotten more value from the experience. If I could go back and do it again with the benefit of what I know now, I would learn more and have more fun. I might skip more parties and I might skip more lectures. I don't know if I'd earn higher grades, but I know I would use those four years to pursue every intellectual passion that I had. I would be involved in a movement. I would design an experiment. I would ask questions that had never been asked before and dig until I had an answer. I would start a foundation. And this is one thing I'm challenging you to do. Maximize your college experience by taking risks instead of being passive. 
But why go to college? Information is not a commodity held locked away in the ivory towers of universities. Information is available and free. If you are motivated and resourceful enough, you can find with a few keystrokes and mouse clicks most all the information you'd ever need in detail, at your disposal, on demand. That doesn't mean you cannot or will not learn a great deal from your college courses and your college professors, but you no longer have to go to college to have this access to information, so you cannot see that as the goal. I recently watched a TED talk where a technologist compared information to food and it got me thinking because I love a good analogy. If information were food, would you wait around for someone to suggest you eat? If information were food, would you be satisfied by letting someone else determine when, where, what, and how much you would eat? I would guess you'd want some say in the menu. If information were food, could we discern a healthy diet from junk food, and most importantly, could you cook? My point is, you can't wait around for information. You must go get it. And once you have it, you must discern good information from bad and work to use it to understand and create something new. Don't spend the next four years sitting in passive lectures, taking tests as summative assessments, and churning out papers. We know you can do that. We challenge you to do more. Simply accumulating information is not an education. I know tons of useless trivia, which may make me the life of most parties, but does not make me an educated man. <laughs> so again, I ask, why go to college? Some might argue that going to college plays a huge role in your social development and maturity, a rite of passage that allows you to grow up, just not too quickly. It's a rest stop before heading off into the real world, and people will tell you to enjoy every minute of this time, as you will never again have this unique combination of freedom and relative lack of responsibility. It will be the most fun four years of your life. Don't get me wrong. I want you to enjoy the next few years, but I suggest that true and lasting enjoyment comes not from partying, but from the pursuit of your passions and knowing you have the potential to make an impact. If you're going to college just to receive a piece of paper that says you're qualified to hold some job and to have some time to grow up while having a good time, you are grossly missing the point. You see, research on happiness suggests that people are most happy when they're engaged in meaningful tasks. Heed the words of Nancy Moschel, who said, the chief cause of failure and unhappiness is trading what we want most for what we want now. I'm challenging you today to be an active participant in your own education. Enjoy it now. It will put you on your path to what you want most. Actively seek out understandings. Pursue interests. Design or create something new. Engage in a meaningful task. Attack every day in college as a chance to improve. Reject passivity. Be relentless in your pursuit. That's how you'll maximize your college experience. What's most exciting about what lies ahead is the endless possibility, the freedom, opportunity, and potential to make meaningful connections and real discoveries. Which brings me to my next point. When you listen to a college commencement speech, the message is often for young graduates to go change the world. I would argue that charge is delivered four years too late. After college, life gets in the way of changing the world. After college, you have bills and responsibilities. When do you have time to change the world? But in college, in college, you're relatively unburdened. You still have idealistic ignorance, childhood curiosity, your natural love of learning. Use them. Change the world now. When you have the time, the freedom, the intellectual capital, the access to resources, guidance and mentoring from professors, other youthful, energetic young people on campus who may jump aboard your crazy idea. College is the time to at least plant the seeds of change. In fact, this may be the most fertile intellectual soil you'll ever occupy. Don't wait. When you think about who has changed the world, who do you think of? I think of people like the students from the University of Georgia who helped Darius Weems' dreams come true. We watched their story on your senior retreat, Darius Goes West. These young college men who on the surface had very little in common with a poor teenager with muscular dystrophy decided on their own accord to take Darius on a life-changing trip across the country. And along the way, they recognized and capitalized on their ability and their potential to raise awareness for handicapped accessibility and to raise money for muscular dystrophy research. 
I think of Evan Bayer and Gavin McIntyre, who as students at Rensselaer University developed the method for using fungus mycelium, take that one in for a second, to self-assemble into a completely organic, non-polluting packaging material, the same functionality as styrofoam, with a production process that has zero carbon emissions. That means they created a replacement for styrofoam that's actually good for the environment. You know who also impresses me? Duke football's offensive line. Yeah, I know. I'm not sure the most sacked quarterback in the nation last year agrees with me, but I'm impressed as this spring that offensive line went to Ethiopia to dig wells by hand so villagers would no longer have to travel miles each day for fresh water. Tabby Gevison impresses me. She's a 15-year-old who started her own online magazine called Rookie for teenage girls so they could find and discuss strong female role models putting a new face on modern feminism. And Taylor Wilson, a 17-year-old nuclear physicist, yes, 17, who at age 14 built a nuclear fusion reactor in his garage. He has since developed a more sensitive radiation detector that replaces the detectors used by Homeland Security, and he made them in his own garage for hundreds of dollars rather than hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're in use now. I'm telling you all this to show what you already know. Young people can change the world. I would suggest young people must change the world. When did Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and Mark Zuckerberg begin their pursuits to change the world? They didn't wait till after graduation. Heck, they didn't graduate. They may not have had time to conceive of Microsoft, Apple, and Facebook had they had their weight of responsibilities weighing down on them. Mark Zuckerberg probably did not set out to change the world as he wrote a program that allowed students to connect. And the world may not be enriched just because I can instantly update my status giving parish Episcopal commencement speech YOLO. <laughs> While I'm certain my status update won't change the course of history, the global connectivity that Facebook has inspired has absolutely changed the world. Waled Rashid, co-founder of the Egypt April 6th movement, came to visit us in chapel recently, and he spoke about the power of Facebook and Twitter as organizational rallying and communication tools, tools so powerful that with it, Egyptians changed the course of history for their country, the rest of North Africa, and maybe the world. He urged you to demand the impossible. He said, have a revolution inside of you, and you should share it. That doesn't mean you have to topple a dictator and, or invent the next global computing platform, but you need to think about how you can change your world, impact your community, use your talents to make a difference. Never before has it been this easy to impact the world. It doesn't take money or political standing. It takes an idea and the passion to move that idea forward. But are there any great ideas left? I heard on a podcast recently the assertion that true innovation has died. All we are seeing now is the redefining, redesigning, and speeding up of existing technology. Charles Buell, the commissioner of the patent office, was quoted saying, Everything that can be invented has already been invented. The year was 1899. <laughs> he clearly had never considered pajama jeans. <laughs> so have all the great ideas been discovered? I certainly don't think so. I would argue that we are only limited in what you can imagine, and we are counting on you to imagine big. In class, on the stage, in the community, and on the field, I hope we have challenged you to be imaginative, to do more than you thought you could do. And since today is my last opportunity to do so, I'm going to challenge you some more. I challenge you to ignore the naysayers. Let them doubt you, and then let them watch you prove them wrong. Chinese proverb says, the person who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the person doing it. <laughs> if you do fail, and you will, I challenge you to be resilient. If you get knocked down 99 times, people need to know that you're going to get up for number 100. Mary Pickford said, this thing called failure is not in the falling down, but in the staying down. I challenge you to embrace and value differences, to see that people don't have to fit in to belong. I challenge you to be healthy, make good decisions regarding your indulgences, exercise regularly, eat well, sleep soundly, that's when you dream. I challenge you to fight the good fight for what you believe in and for those who can't fight for themselves. As Thomas Jefferson said, in matters of style, swim with the current. In matters of principle, 
stand like a rock. So even if you lose, you'll do so with your honor intact. From our talk earlier this year, I challenge you to choose the pain of discipline over the pain of regret. Remembering the pain of discipline is only felt while we're in the midst of the task, but the pain of regret can last a lifetime. I challenge you to be humble. Recognize that you don't know everything, though it may seem like it now. You may not even be aware of what you don't know. Einstein said, listen to people who to say they are searching for truth, never those who say they've found it. I challenge you to take it personally. Your work must matter to you. I challenge you to be compassionate and forgiving because God knows you want others to be passionate and forgiving to you. And I challenge you to consider whatever, as in whatever it takes, whatever it takes to live up to the standards your families have instilled in you, whatever your individual talents allow you to do to embody the tenets of wisdom, honor, and service that your school has encouraged in you. I started out my address by saying I wasn't impressed by your graduating today. But that doesn't mean you haven't impressed me in your time here. How can I not be impressed by a student who has accumulated 710 hours of community service, teaching leadership and mentoring youth with his work at Project Transformation and the National Hispanic Institute? Or the student who developed and implemented a math curriculum for middle school girls to get them excited about and willing to take leadership roles in mathematics? or a student who had two original films screened at local film festivals. I stand in awe of the astounding professional, dramatic, and musical performance y'all have produced and the budding robotics program you've pioneered. And I'm impressed by a student who, to honor his father, at the age of nine, took on a leadership role with the nonprofit Links for Leukemia and personally helped raise over $100,000 for leukemia research. And I know that it's through hard work that one can not only bench press 475 pounds, but can also lift the 3.7 GPA and compete in the Ivy League next year. These are just a few examples of the greatness this class has demonstrated. So yes, I've been impressed. Now I challenge you, impress me again. Class of 2012, I'm proud of you. I know you're ready. I wish you the best. Now go change your world. Thank you. my pleasure to present the class of 2012 to the board chair and the head of school for the awarding of diplomas. As each student's name is announced, family members are encouraged to stand for better viewing. Polite applause is encouraged. Will the first row of graduates please stand? <laughs> 